what we thought was the reality, what we took to be the reality so far, in which we suffered, that becomes an appearance. It's not the ultimate reality. There is an underlying divinity which is the ultimate reality which is to be discovered. Covered, uncovered, discovered. This whole idea of Jagat Mithya, the world is an appearance. This has to be understood properly. It, do, it's not, it does not mean dismiss this. Here itself is that divinity. So if you dismiss this and say that some other divinity is there, you have missed it. Uh, Swami Vivekananda powerfully says, He who plunges headlong into the foolish luxuries of this world has missed the way. He who runs away from this world to meditate and die in a Himalayan cave and who hates the world, who scorns the world, he has missed the way. Both of them have missed the way. If you catch hold of this reality, you have missed the way. If you let go of this and run off somewhere else trying to find a God elsewhere, you have missed the way. But that's very strange. Either you take the world or you give it up. But where is the third option? Swami Vivekananda says, find God here here itself, wherever you are, with whomever you are with, there itself you can find God, it's because God is there. You know the example of the ornaments and gold. Suppose there are ornaments made of gold. So there's a nice story, there's very, many little stories which are used by the monks in the Himalayas to illustrate this point. One is the story of a, of a jeweler, um, so he has a little son, and the jeweler would keep all the, his, his materials and ornaments locked up in a safe. Once he tells his son, uh, my son, go to the safe, here's the key, open it, and get some gold from there. I have to use it in my work. And the child runs off, and he opens the safe, and then he comes back and says, there's no gold. And his father says, what? There, there is, go and take a good look. Comes and says, no, there is no gold. What did you find? Well, there are necklaces and uh, uh, bracelets and tiaras, but no gold. His father says, look, what you think is a necklace, is a bracelet, is a tiara, is actually gold. So bring any of that, that will do. Notice then. What the child thought was, there is some reality called gold which my father wants me to seek. And here are these things which are not, which are, this is of course a necklace. This is of course a bracelet. It can't be gold. The gold must be something apart from this. Big mistake. Give it up. Look for gold elsewhere. You'll never find it. Take the necklace itself to be gold? No. Because the moment the necklace is melted and made into a bracelet, you will think gold is gone. You see? That other story of the, um, of the man who goes to a pawn shop of a businessman who has fallen on hard days and goes to a pawn shop and gives his image of Ganesha to the <laughs> um, pawn shop owner and says, give me some money. And the pawn shop owner weighs the image and gives him some money. This is the rate at which I will give, give you money for the image of Ganesha. And you know, Ganesha comes with his ride, which is the, the mouse. So all the deities have their own vehicles. Durga has a much more glamorous vehicle, the lion. But Ganesha has a mouse. And the businessman says to the pawn shop owner, so that's, this is the money for Ganesha. How much for the mouse? And the owner, shop owner says that it's the same rate. Take it or leave it. It's the same rate. And this businessman is outraged. He says, what? Man, do you have no religion? You're giving the same rate for Ganesha as for a mouse. Is Ganesha and a mouse the same for you? And this shopkeeper says with a smile, Sir, look, for you it may be Ganesha, for you it may be a mouse. For me it's gold. And I wait and treat it accordingly. So there is an underlying reality. Yeah. If you toss away the, the whole of it, then you have missed God. If you take only the name and the form, then you are hold, holding on to samsara, not to God. So, seeing God in everything, Swami Vivekananda powerfully says, then what becomes of renunciation? Do you have to give up your husband and wife and children? No. To become spiritual? No, he says. Find God in the husband, in the wife, in the children. There is an old tradition in India of naming children, giving the names of gods and goddesses to children. That was the original uh, purpose, to remind you that it is a divinity right there. 
So find God in every person, with the people you're working with, in the living and the non-living, in the environment. It's not imagination. Vedanta says that it is that one reality, Satchidananda, with names and forms, which appears as this world before us. Now what happens to renunciation? The old teaching, give up the world if you want God. Notice, then there is a deeper meaning to renunciation. What is renunciation in this paradigm? It is to renunciation, true renunciation, the highest renunciation is to see God in everything. That itself is renunciation. The second line of the mantra, Tena tyaktena bhunjitha magridha kasya swidhanam Protect this knowledge, this insight you have by renunciation. What does it mean? Once you get this insight, the Lord that I love, the divinity, God, is here in everything, in and through everything. Now live your life according to that. You see, what is the problem? Buddha found out long ago, 2500 years ago, our real source of suffering, dukkha, is desire. Trishna, desire. I want, this is nice, this is good, I need it. Why? With that, my life will be fulfilled. And there are certain things which are bad and it's disturbing me, it's horrible. I want to get rid of this, I want to get hold of that desire. And once that starts, there is suffering. Now we understand why there should be suffering. Why is this wrong? Because it puts us in a false position. If it is the same reality everywhere, same Brahman, and this Brahman is Atman, you yourself. Shankaracharya in his commentary, he says, cover everything by the Lord. Isham, Isha means the Lord, means God. Cover everything by God. And then see how he tra transmutes the term. Isha means Paramatma, the soul of everything. Paramatma is your own Atma, is your own own self. So cover everything by God. God alone is everything. What it means is, I alone am everything. Ahamevaidam sarvam. I alone, my real nature, who I really am, that alone is expressed in all these ways. Now, if I alone am expressed in all these ways, I am all of this. What could I want? I'm, I'm that already. What will, it, what will it avail me if I shift some property from that body to this body? Because I am that one and this one too. From that point of view, from the Atman point of view, with this, this feeling of that universal self, I am the self in all, then the whole question of particular desires to fulfill myself, it disappears immediately. That beautiful story of the princess of Kashi, where um, some of you know, there was a dramatic performance in the court of an ancient Indian king, and one of the characters was supposed to be the princess of Kashi. It was a little girl. Kashi, you know, Banaras, the holy city of the Hindus. So that was a character. Uh, that was a role in the, in the drama. And the queen said, who will play that role? Well, the prince of that kingdom, he was five years old at that time. He's a cute little boy. You can dress him up as a princess and he can play the role. And that was done. And he looked so nice. The queen said, paint a portrait of the prince in the dress of the princess of Kashi. And that was done. A nice portrait was made and was signed and dated. Years later, when the prince grew up, maybe 15 years later, one day while exploring the palace, he goes to the cellar and among the old stuff he's rummaging around, he finds this old portrait. He rubs the dust of it and sees the princess of Kashi, looks at the date. Oh, she must be my age. She, 15 years ago, and she was my age. And he falls in love with her. And he says, I must marry her, otherwise I'll never be happy again. But he's a little shy, he can't tell his parents. He mopes and uh, um, soon the father, the, prince, the king and the queen note that something is wrong with the prince, but he won't say. Finally, a wise old minister takes him aside and asks him, what ails the prince? Tell me, you can confide in me. And the prince says, I am in love. And the Minister says, very good, who is she? She is the princess of Kashi. Oh, princess, very good. You'll be a suitable uh, bride for you. Where did you meet her? I haven't actually met her, but um, I can show you her picture. 
and it's an old picture um, painted 15 years ago but anyway she's uh, obviously my age the minister said wait a minute old picture 15 years ago where did you see this can you take me there and the prince takes him to the cellar this is the picture and the uh, minister looks at it and says prince you need to sit down <laughs> this is not the princess of kashi well whoever she is i'll marry her no then he tells the prince the whole story of the dramatic performance and how he was dressed up as a little kid as the princess of kashi how the portrait came to be painted and says prince that thou art tatvamasi now what happened to the prince's desire for the princess of kashi it disappears immediately why does it disappear because the princess is married off and he, he cannot have her anymore no because the princess is dead no because the princess does not exist not quite he himself is that princess he forever that princess and he were one and the same there's really nothing other than him outside himself which he can get for his own fulfillment he is that princess is himself and is ever fulfilled this world is our princess of kashi this world is our princess of kashi the isha upanishad says magrid hakasya swidhanam do not covet for whose is wealth whose is wealth that's the original uh, statement of the upanishad and commentators after commentators have interpreted that they say whose is wealth a devotional approach to vedanta will say all wealth belongs to god whatever can be nice and desirable in the world belongs to god not to us including our bodies and minds so that's a from a devotional approach from a gyana approach the knowledge approach shankaracharya comments whose is wealth what wealth is there apart from the atman the self brahman that alone appears as all wealth what where are the jewels apart from the gold where are the pot where is the pottery apart from the clay where are the waves apart from the ocean similarly where is the universe apart from brahman what is there to be coveted because you are that brahman not part of it there is no part and whole here it's only one reality and you are that entire one reality what is there to be coveted so knowing this now live your life seeing god in everybody vivekananda is eloquent there seeing god in happiness and in misery the so called happiness and misery necklace and bangle both two things made of the same gold so no 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 swami misery is very nasty happiness is nice but i tell you when you see the underlying reality when you see the same divinity underlying a um, um, uh, an unpleasant occurrence and the most pleasant thing you will you will have what is called samadrishti again and samadrishti means an evenness of vision the way it is translated it sounds like a ophthalmic defect or something you know, like short sighted even sighted they will translate it short sighted long sighted even but what it means is you see a oneness everywhere in this universe seeing that oneness and that oneness you are seeing that oneness the so called good things of the world and the so called miserable things of the world are neither so good anymore neither so miserable anymore you find a light in the worst of circumstances you see the same constant light is shining and in the most nicest of things when good things happen you find it is the same light appearing as that a certain from that comes real renunciation you are no longer pursuing things the products of maya for your fulfillment it can never fulfill you so i vivekananda said we are sitting near an ocean of nectar and dying of thirst we are sitting next to heaps of food and dying of hunger what we seek for fulfillment is right here within us we don't see it at all we mistake it again and again what is the mistake we see it as the world out there i am this that is the world and the world has two faces attractive tempting or fearful terrifying tempting and terrifying swami vivekananda said these things are dead in themselves we breathe life into them then we run towards them or we run away from them <laughs> and that becomes samsara for us magridhakasya swidhanam 
do not covet wealth because whose is wealth after all in fact he says there is no wealth there is what you consider to be attractive things is all like the princes of kashi it's an appearance of you yourself projected out there a product of maya then how do you how does one live how does one live in this world what becomes of work activities of the world do you have to give them up not at all it is the enlightened person who can work how the person in samsara driven by hope and temptation driven by fear and anxiety and the great fear of death how can this person work really truly it is the enlightened person it is the sage and the saint who can do good work entirely working completely out of a sense of for fulfillment for the world not for personal fulfillment personally always fulfilled always happy the next verse the next mantra of the upanishad kurvanne veh karmani je je vishet shataggam samaha evang tvai nanya theto asti na karma lipyate nare work in this way seek to work in this way seek to live a hundred years so i'm vivek on this translation seek to live a hundred years a blessed life of happiness and fulfillment your whole life will be a blessing to the world around you working in this way seeing god in everything and thus working thus working you will fulfill your life be a blessing to others and it is only in this way you will not be trapped by karma na karma lipyate nare otherwise what happens is the law of karma works and traps us in samsara good good bad bad and none escape the law that is the law of karma when we see our, when we see samsara but when we see brahman that one reality within us the divinity then you escape from the law of karma it does not touch you anymore here is an interesting thing shankaracharya wrote his famous commentary on the ishopanishad 1400 years ago and swami vivekananda gave this talk in 1896 in the first mantra it's very interesting in the first mantra the most important mantra cover everything by the lord isha vasyam idam sarvam shankaracharya and swami vivekananda agree absolutely in the second mantra Swami Vivekananda and Shankaracharya disagree completely. I'll first tell you what is the traditional interpretation Shankaracharya has given. It's very interesting. What Shankaracharya has done is the 18 mantras of the Isha Upanishad he has neatly split into two parts. Upanishad itself has two parts. One part is for the one on the path of knowledge the enlightened one, the one who is already enlightened or seeking enlightenment. path of knowledge the second part of the isha upanishad according to shankaracharya is the conventional religious life good moral life yeah. ethical moral life in the vedic sense so what shankaracharya does is up to now whatever i've said what vivekananda says shankaracharya says the same thing 1400 years ago absolutely no disagreement divinize your life see god in everything and your life turns into a blessing there itself is renunciation not actually giving up the jewels and looking for gold elsewhere there itself seeing the gold in the jewels and vivekananda is very clear have your prosperity he would say have your manhattan have your jobs have your vacations have your cars whatever it is but see the one divinity in that don't see that your fulfillment in this don't those things and in the lack of those things you are unfulfilled no 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 you are ever fulfilled but coming to the second mantra shankaracharya says itarasya he says for those who are enlightened that is the first mantra for those who are seeking enlightenment that's the first mantra itarasya for others anatmagat anatmagyataya not those who are not knowers of the real self that i am brahman they don't know this atmagyana ashaktasya who are incapable of knowing who are incapable of knowing idam upadishati mantra these are the instructions what are the instructions if you are not walking on the path of enlightenment if it does not appeal to you if this world appeals to you i will be happy here in this world and after death i will go to higher worlds you know swarga heaven then what is the way then the way is there is another track track 2 Track one for the smart kids. 
Track two for the rest. Track two is Kurvan Neveha Karmani, the same mantra. Performing all religious acts. Here, karma means Vedic religious acts. The fire sacrifice, uh, the yagya, the fire sacrifice. The really, what, what a traditional religious Hindu would do in Vedic times. Performing those acts. Seek to live out your full span of life. Be a religious person, ritualistic person, moral person. And in this way, live your life so that at the end of your life, you have this accumulated merit, you have good karma and a purified mind. And therefore, and then you will, and he interprets several mantras. He says, by following that path, you will go on to higher worlds and ultimately be ready for enlightenment also. You will go to and come to the same enlightenment, but you will take the scenic route. You will live this life, maybe other lives, go to heaven, maybe multiple heavens, and ulti ultimately end up in what was called the world of the Brahma Loka, the world of Brahman, where you still retain an identity, but you are now then on the fast track to enlightenment. There. How many lifetimes later, we do not know, but that's. So this was called Krama Mukti, sequential path to sequential path to liberation. And this first mantra, seeing God everywhere, right here, right now, Sadyo Mukti, instant liberation, here and now and forever. So I'll take the first one. <laughs> Shankaracharya says, this mantra is meant for those who want the second path. And then he says, the rest of the Upanishad, from mantra number three to mantra number eight. Mantra number three to mantra number eight is a development of Brahma Jnana. The, the teaching about I am Brahman, seeing Brahman in all beings. That teaching is developed in mantra number three to eight. And then again from mantra number nine to eighteen till the end of the Upanishad is the second path of Vedic ritualism and Vedic rites and a, a ritualistic religious lifestyle leading to higher worlds and, and, a, and a kind of moral religious life, not enlightenment. So that's how he divides it. That's what makes this Upanishad a difficult Upanishad. There is a sudden switch of, of, um, of tone suddenly in the middle of the Upanishad. What does Swami Vivekananda do? He interprets the entire Upanishad from beginning to end in the same tone. It's all about enlightenment. In notice, instead of saying that this is for the people, seeing God in everybody is for those who are seeking knowledge and enlightenment. The next one is for people who want to lead a conventional moral life. He says, no, no. Seeing God in everybody, seeing God in everything, this is real renunciation. Now, with that God vision of seeing Brahman inside and outside, seek to live a blessed life. That is the interpretation of the second mantra. Whereas Shankaracharya makes a clean division there. This is not for you. You are all Vedanta society. Mantra one, fast track. And for the rest of them out there, mantra two. Suppose you say that moral, ritualistic, religious lifestyle, most people out there are not interested. Then what happens? Then this is what happens is, is dangerous. Yeah. Then if you do not take recourse to mo um, morality and ethics, in today's world, nobody wants you to perform, uh, is asking you to perform fire sacrifices in Central Park. But, um, but a moral, a religious, uh, uh, ethical lifestyle, if you do not do that, the next option is unethical lifestyle, uncontrolled lifestyle. And with the consequences, the law of karma will teach you then. The result of, uh, of an unrestrained, unethical lifestyle. So that is Shankaracharya's vision. Swami Vivekananda's vision is, the whole thing is one integrated uh, message. See God in everything and thus live your life. 